Good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Slavosky, and I'm going to be your moderator this evening. Thank you for joining this live telephone town hall held by Congressman Matt Cartwright. Tonight, Congressman Cartwright will be discussing and taking questions from you about the latest on coronavirus relief legislation being developed in Congress right now, uh, Pennsylvania's COVID-19 vaccination efforts, both the Northeastern Pennsylvanians to help you navigate this ongoing crisis. Joining him to answer uh, your questions are uh, Kira Kleinpeter, and she is the Executive Deputy Secretary at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Prior to serving in this role, uh, Ms. Kleinpeter was the Senior Advisor to the Secretary of Health, where she advised the Secretary on the response to COVID-19 and long-term care facilities. Uh, also joining us is Stephen Dixel, who serves as the District Director for the U.S. Small Business Administration's Eastern Pennsylvania District Office. He is responsible for the delivery and leadership of the agency's financial and business development programs throughout the east, eastern 40 counties of Pennsylvania. And he is joined also by Michael King, who serves as the deputy director of the Eastern Pennsylvania District Office of the SBA. Uh, he's been with the SBA since 2007 and is responsible for the delivery of SBA programs and services to small businesses, resource partners, and community organizations. And both Stephen and Michael will help uh, be available to answer questions related to small business relief. Uh, this is an interactive forum, and your questions are welcome. If you have one, you can press star three on your phone keypad at any time, star three, and you will be placed in line to speak with a member of our staff. They will take down your name, and where you are calling from, and the details of your question. If you hear your name, you will be live on the call and you will be able to ask your question directly to the panel. If you are streaming the event on the Congressman's website, cartwright.house.gov slash live, you can simply type your, question, your name and your question below the streaming player. We are also live on Facebook, and we'll take some questions there. We'll do our best to get to as many as we can, but we have a large audience this evening, and it may not be possible. If we're not able to get to your question live, you can hang on until the end of the event and leave a voicemail after we end, or you could send us an email through the Congressman's website at cartwright.house.gov slash contact, or call us at 570-341-1050. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Congressman Cartwright to kick us off. Congressman, go ahead. Well, thanks, Matt, uh, and good evening uh, to everyone joining in, and thanks for joining us. Uh, happy Mardi Gras. I uh, wish we didn't have to spend Mardi Gras talking about COVID-19 and its effects on our people and our economy. Uh, obviously been uh, just more than a year now since this pandemic turned up on American shores. It's uh, hard to wrap your head around the, uh, the pain and the hardship we have gone through. Uh, individually and, and as a, a nation. Um, and it's it's been easy to think about the differences between us and our neighbors, but no matter where you are or what your background is, everybody knows somebody who has lost a job, uh, who has lost a friend or a loved one or a business, uh, or you experience one or more of those tragedies yourself. Um, so it's it, it's a it's a story of uh, loss and hardship, and that's what I think about when I when it comes to COVID nineteen and COVID nineteen response, and that's why providing direct relief to the people that have been hurt by this pandemic remains a top priority for this new Congress for me. Um, so right now we have two safe and effective vaccines out there. Uh, and the third is likely available soon. Um, uh, and and really, uh, an end to this public health crisis is in sight. But it's not over. We're not out of the woods yet, and rebuilding is going to take uh, some time. So that's what he, we're here to talk about this evening. Um, if you've been following this, uh, you notice that after uh, basically a half a year of um, uh, inactivity from the Senate, uh, we've passed a watered-down uh, COVID-19 
relief compromise in December. Uh, I am glad we got something done, but as uh, has been said, it was only a Band-Aid, a down payment. Um, the stimulus checks were, were far too little, and some of the relief from that package is already set to expire within a month from now. So there's no question it wasn't enough and more needs to be done. And uh, people of all political stripes and economists, uh, uh, pretty much to a person, agree that uh, we need to do more to ensure everybody's economic well-being and distribute the vaccines as, as soon as possible. There is more help on the way. In the, the U.S. House of Representatives, we are finishing up the process of putting uh, President Biden's American Rescue Plan into writing. Um, this has been a big effort involving several of, uh, of the big committees. Um, it is shaping uh, to be an aggressive COVID response and relief bill that, that will enhance important direct relief life, lifelines that I've been pushing for, like housing and food assistance, small business aid, funding to keep local police and first responders on the payroll. Um, it does honor our commitment to delivering the remaining $1,400 in direct payments to struggling Americans, uh, bringing that total stimulus to $2,000, uh, as I agreed should have been there from the start. It's a proposal that will help us get back to normal faster with investments in coordinated vaccine distribution, uh, in testing, and in emergency response. In the meantime, I know people in northeastern Pennsylvania and in our area's businesses have questions about the relief that is available to them right now, as well as the vaccine distribution efforts across northeastern Pennsylvania. So tonight, what we've done is we put together a, a, a distinguished group of panelists to help answer your questions. We're joined by Kira Kleinpeter, Executive Deputy Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Health, who can help answer questions about our Commonwealth's vaccine distribution program. Uh, and as Matt said, uh, we also have Stephen Dixel and Michael Kane, the director and deputy director of the Eastern Pennsylvania Small Business Administration Office. And um, and I want to say uh, the SBA w uh, were heroes working with local bankers who deal with the SBA a lot. Um, th these folks were working nights and weekends to get out uh, relief to our small businesses, uh, in, including uh, restaurants uh, and hospitality industry. Um, and, and this is an effort that continues, and I'm grateful for them being on this call as well. They're going to be able to help answer questions about small business relief and uh, employment issues. So we're looking forward to your questions, uh, but first I want to uh, give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, starting with you, Secretary Klein-Peter, uh, why don't you, you start us off? Thank you so much, Congressman. It's wonderful to be with all of you uh, this evening. My name is Kira Klein-Peter. Uh, I'm now in my third week uh, as serving as Executive Deputy Secretary for the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Um, Acting Secretary Beam asked me to step into, into this role after serving uh, as a Senior Advisor for Secretary Levine. Um, and so uh, it's been a pleasure to transition in this capacity. I'm looking forward to your questions tonight about all things vaccine, vaccine rollout. Uh, I'm not a clinician, uh, but I'm happy to, to the best of my ability, answer any questions that I can about the vaccine itself. Um, and really looking forward to hearing from all of you to get your feedback and provide you with the most up-to-date and accurate information I can. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. And um, uh, uh, Stephen, do you want to weigh in? Uh, yes, and, and good evening. And thank you very much, Congressman Cartwright, for hosting today's event. Mike Kane, my Deputy District Director, and I are happy to be here with you and answer any questions small businesses may have. 
Let me first start by saying the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly impacted the engine of the U.S. economy over the last year. And that engine continues to be small businesses. As your constituents know, Congressman Cartwright, small businesses exist not only as our economic engine, but as the cornerstone of our communities across America. And the recent CARES Act and Economic Aid Act legislation passed by Congress with your support has provided an essential lifeline to affected small businesses to support the capital that is much needed and vital to the recovery and survival. SBA programs such as the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, the Idle Advance, the Paycheck Protection Program, and soon to come, Shuttered Venues Operators Grant Program have all been critical to helping small businesses stay in business and continue to pay their employees during the most challenging of economic situations any of us have seen in our lifetimes. And in terms of Pennsylvania, SBA thus far is proud to report that we have approved over 220,000 payroll protection program loans for nearly $24 billion, which is 3.5 times the number of loans that the entire SBA 7A and 504 loan program executes in a normal fiscal year. Most of all, Congressman Cartwright, Mike Kane and I are delighted to be here. We are delighted to answer any questions small businesses might have about our programs. Thank you for your time, sir. Let me follow up. The, that statistic, 220,000 uh, loans, that, that, um, th that's in what area? Certainly. Well, our top three areas are construction, retail, and professional and scientific areas. Okay. What we've done uh, two hundred. I, I was sure. I was wondering uh, uh, geographic. What you, you, is that? Is that the whole country? It's, is that? No, it's actually just in the state of Pennsylvania. Right. Okay. Two hundred and twenty thousand separate uh, emergency loans to uh, uh, businesses in Pennsylvania. That's correct. Okay. Sir. For nearly twenty-five okay. billion dollars. Fine. Thank you. I'd like to now uh, to get to uh, our um, participants' questions here. And just a quick reminder for anyone who joined us in the middle of things, if you have a question, you can press star three on your keypad to get in the queue to ask a question, and you'll be connected with a member of the staff. And if you're listening online, you can submit your question below the streaming player on the website or the Facebook Live comment section. And now I'd like to open our first question. Uh, this is Kathleen from Scranton about uh, access to vaccines. Kathleen, you're now live. Thank you, Congressman Cartwright. I am a private caregiver for a 91, going on 92-year-old woman, and I'm nearly 70 myself. I'll be 70 in July. And I've been trying all different avenues to try and get the COVID, both for me and for her, because of her age. And um, I don't live in, I go, you know, into her every day because she, she is ambulatory, but she doesn't get out and about. So I wondered, I have signed up with Geisinger with my local pharmacy, with CVS, but so far I haven't heard from anybody. So I just wondered, is there an avenue I can try to, you know, for both of us to get it? All right, Kara Klein, Peter, um, let me toss this to you. Sure, thanks, Congressman, and, and thanks, Kathleen, for the question. Um, so I think the approach you're taking makes good sense. So right now in Pennsylvania, um, we are in the process of going through our phased rollout plan. So we've identified uh, folks who should receive the vaccine first um, in a prioritized manner uh, based on their risk, uh, in terms of their employment or their health status. Uh, so those age 65 and older and those with certain comorbid conditions. Um, so assuming that, uh, Kathleen, both you and, and the individual for whom you care um, qualify to be part of 1A, 
I would encourage you to go on. Oh, and you can find out if you qualify um, based on, you know, your certain uh, uh, parameters by using a tool on our website called Your Turn. Um, you have uh, a few simple questions to answer, and it can confirm for you if you're part of the 1A group, which is what we're currently uh, vaccinating. If you are eligible, uh, then it will connect you to a map. And so you'll be able to look in your community right around that Wilkes-Barre, Scranton area, maybe beyond, uh, to see where there are providers who have vaccine. Um, and so you can look in your community, uh, find those phone numbers, uh, and give them a call or make an appointment on your website. If you don't have um, uh, access to the Internet or aren't as comfortable using our website, um, you can call 877 PA Health, and someone, a live representative, will answer the phone, walk you through the questions on the Your Turn tool, help you find um, what part of the phased rollout you're in, and then can help you even uh, identify some phone numbers or websites to use um, to make an appointment with somebody in your area. Thanks, Congressman. Sure, and Kara, if you don't mind, I. I Hang on, Matt. <clears throat> Karen, if you don't mind, I'd like to follow that up. Sound like Kathleen clearly is 1A, and so is her uh, her uh, her caregiving recipient. Um, and it sounds like she's also done that. She's talked to Geisinger and CVS, and um, I think. And and what we're hearing a lot in this area is that uh, people are not, e even though they qualify, people are not. They're being told we we don't have any more appointments. Um, and I, first off, are you aware that uh, uh, Ms. Klein Peter? And uh, second of all, what, what should people what should people expect? Sure, we're absolutely aware of that. I mean, um, the challenge is that uh, there is not enough vaccine, uh, or thereby appointments available for the great demand that we're seeing for the vaccine. Um, so in a given week, you know, we as an entire state get roughly 175,000 first doses. There's, you know, over 13 million people who live in the Commonwealth. And so there is this disconnect between the demand for the vaccine and the supply that's available. And so we're absolutely seeing this across the Commonwealth. I think getting your name on, on a list with Geisinger or CVS is absolutely the right thing to do. We are every day advocating um, to the federal government for an increased allocation to Pennsylvania. Um, and until then, you know, we have to uh, remain patient and continue to use all of those good public health practices to keep ourselves safe. Okay. so. Uh even though Kathleen is doing everything right, uh, she, uh, she has to remain patient because of the shortage of vaccine. And I understand that, and this is where I want to weigh in. Um, I expect the American Rescue Plan that we're going to pass soon in the House uh, will provide about $160 billion for the national vaccination plan, including supplies, emergency response, testing, and hiring workers needed to boost the public health response um, to this virus spread. Uh, it is a huge logistical challenge, um, but uh, we in Congress are, are focused on passing the American Rescue Plan to get the money going. And if you've noticed, um, the Biden administration has um, arranged for the purchase of uh, 200 million doses uh, and that, that's all part and parcel of this American Rescue Plan uh, that'll be uh, over the next couple of weeks. It's, it's going to be finalized and pushed out of the House and over to the Senate. Um, so um, it, it's frustrating, but uh, the, the wheels are in motion, and uh, I wanted to get that out there. Back to you, Matt. I'd like to take a question from online. Uh, Listener, uh, name is Sarah from Clark Summit. So the question: If there is going to be aid, aid or grants to nano businesses that were either too new or too small to qualify for help, 
uh, from the SBA, but they have been impacted. Okay. Uh, uh, Stephen and Michael, uh, let me toss that over to you guys. Congressman, this is Mike Kane, uh, Deputy Director here at SBA, and, uh, and I want to echo what Steve said earlier. Thank you for uh, including us uh, here on this call. Um, so to answer the, the, the question, um, you know, in order to qualify currently for uh, the emergency programs that Steve mentioned, such as the Economic Injury Disaster Loan or the Paycheck Protection Program, a business would need to have been in business uh, by February 15th of 2020. So if they uh, started their business after that point in time, uh, unfortunately, they would not qualify uh, for the current programs. Um, in terms of, uh, you, know, you know, much smaller businesses, I, I think the term that they used was a nano business or something like that. Uh, you know, any sole proprietor, uh, you know, is going to qualify for the PPP and for EIDL. Again, so long as they were in business uh, and they were receiving revenue and so forth, uh, no later than February 15th of 2020. Right. And I should also throw in, um, Mike, that uh, just because you're a sole proprietor does not mean that you're ineligible for unemployment compensation benefits. Uh, when we first passed the CARES Act last spring, uh, a lot of people didn't realize that. And, um, and then when they did, they applied for it, and um, uh, this is not a knock on the state government, but the, you know, the unemployment compensation system was set up with a computer system, and you, you know, you get on a website, and you fill it, fill out the form, and if it turned out that you're self-employed, it would flush you out of the website, um, uh, because. When self-employed people traditionally never did qualify for unemployment compensation, so um, they had to change. They actually had to. That website was so old that they had to. They had uh, put a search on for people that knew how to program in COBOL language for computers. <laughs> it was 25-year-old website. So um, eventually, they started sorting that out. But that's part of the answer. Uh, if you're a uh, a nano business, you know, so small and maybe sole proprietor, um, uh, consider uh, unemployment benefits as well because that's not that's not out of bounds for you. Matt? Okay, our next question comes from Lori Ann from Wilkes-Barre about uh, the question about mass vaccination sites or uh, deploying the National Guard. Lori Ann, you're now live. Hello, thank you so much for taking my call. Um, my question is about the percentage of people that have been fully vaccinated in Pennsylvania. And I'm looking at the John Hopkins website right now, and we're at 3.56%. And even our neighbors in New York, they're at 5.31%, New Jersey 4.33%. And I was wondering if there was any plan for mass vaccination sites. And I am a pharmacist, so I do understand the shortage, vaccine shortage. Um, but to get the numbers that we need to get people caught up, um, we need some mass vaccination sites and perhaps some National Guard help. And I just want to say quickly about Kathleen's comment earlier. I have a mom that's uh, 85 with dementia, and unless I got on the computer to make an appointment for her, it's very hard for the seniors to get any kind of appointment through a phone call. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, Secretary Kleinpeter, I'm going to turn that over to you. And and that's uh, wow, that's throwing down the that's throwing down the gantlet. Uh, our our neighboring states are doing better than us. What's what's the answer? Sure. So I think the important thing to uh, uh, focus on is actually the number of vaccines in total that have been administered. Um, so the number of vaccines uh, that have actually been administered, 77% of the first doses that have been allocated have actually been administered. Um, and 35% of the second doses allocated have been administered. Now, that number might be a little lower than we would like at this point due actually to some inclement weather incidents that we've had um, happening of late. Uh, but nonetheless, I think your suggestion of mass vaccination um, is, a, is a good one. Um, so what we're doing right now is trying to uh, 
if you will, narrow the number of providers who are actually enrolled, or excuse me, who are receiving vaccine, and ensure that the vaccine is going to those providers who can do the greatest volume as fast as possible. Because as a pharmacist, you know that right now, we have to vaccinate as many people as possible, not just to move towards herd immunity, but to beat the variants. And vaccinating people as fast as possible has to be the priority. So we do have good providers, whether they're pharmacies or health systems or community, municipal health departments, FQHCs, who are really able to vaccinate that large number of people. And so we've started prioritizing giving vaccine to those places. But that's not uh, solely at the um, expense of, of equity and ensuring that uh, all different communities have access. And that's where not just mass vaccination, but community vaccination sites come into play. Um, and so the Department of Health is partnering really closely with Pennsylvania's Emergency Management Agency to establish this co these community and mass vaccination sites. And so the difference between those two is kind of important. So I think of mass vaccination sites as Beaver Stadium, right? We're vaccinating 20,000 people a day. And as you know, we just don't have the vaccine supply to vaccinate that many people right now that quickly, although that's absolutely the goal that we'd like to be able to do. So instead, we're looking at where can we stand up these community vaccination sites to move people through quickly, absolutely to your point, but to ensure that we're strategically placing those sites uh, in areas where otherwise they may not have access to the vaccine in the same way. So that's kind of our, our goal and our strategy. We doubled down on that when we issued an order on Friday to enrolled providers who are receiving vaccine that requires them to use 80% of their first doses in seven days. So that, that's not the second doses, it, which, you know, there is a clinical timing that is really important there of, of using the second dose or administering the second dose, rather, between 28 and 42 days. But for first doses, we're saying to the providers now, you are required by order of the secretary to use 80% of those first doses within seven days. To the 1A population, you've got to report your data to us, including racial and ethnic data, um, and uh, uh, that, that is the approach that we've taken. So uh, one of the other things in that order that I think addresses the last concern you raised was around the challenge that seniors um, are having making appointments online. So as part of this order, now enrolled providers receiving vaccine have to have posted on their website, which I realize may not be ideal, but they have to have posted on their website a publicly available phone number that an actual person answers to schedule an appointment. So our hope is that, um, you know, even if an individual doesn't have access to the internet or they're not super computer savvy, that they can call our 877-PA health number um, and the folks on the line for PA health are gonna be able to give that senior a phone number that they can call um, in order to set up that appointment. Um, so I couldn't agree with you more. I think vaccinating people as fast as possible is really important. We're trying to do that through a couple different channels, including giving the vaccine to providers who move the product out quickly, looking at community vaccination and mass vaccination sites where it's appropriate, putting out this order that requires providers to you know, move the product quickly, and then making sure that you can make an appointment via phone, not just uh, through an online portal. Um, I, I hope that helps. Thank and you. Let, and actually, let me add, Matt, I, I want to add uh, uh, Secretary Klein Peter talked about uh, emergency um, uh, uh, emergency management money being used to uh, set up community vaccination centers, and, and that is true, and that. That originates with the, the federal government, uh, the uh, Federal Emergency and Manage Management Agency, FEMA. FEMA money was released to, to stand up uh, vaccination centers with the help of the National Guard. So the, the federal government is, is also partnering with several major pharmacies, as you may have noticed, 
to enable people to be vaccinated in those locations. And this is a pr program that just started last week. So um, we're going to uh, we're we're going to remind Secretary Klein Peter. We, uh, 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 people are comparing Pennsylvania efforts with our neighbors. Thanks for the question. Okay, um, at this time we see we're still getting a good number of questions about vaccines and to help uh, streamline the questions that we get to, I'd like to actually turn to a dial pad poll so that everyone listening here on the phone um, or online can participate on the website. Um, right now you can, uh, we have a couple of options. If you are having trouble getting an appointment for a vaccine dose, please press one. If you got an appointment but have a long wait time, please press two. If your vaccination site after you've got your appointment is far too far away from you to get to, please press three. Or if you do not know where to find information on vaccine distribution, please plus press four. So Matt, you're saying they just have to press those numbers. They don't have to press uh, star or pound or anything. They just press the numbers. So from the early results, we're seeing that it's still a good number of people that say um, they're having trouble getting an appointment. And I know that on Facebook, our comments show that there is a particular interest in how to access those and or where new sites may come up in Monroe County, Pike County, and Wayne County. This is Kira Kleinpeter. Would you like me to take that question? Please. Great. Um, so actually, uh, Pima set up a community vaccination site in Pike County here, I guess, two or three weeks ago. I would have to um, check on the exact timing of it. Um, that was a really successful site. Uh, we did, I think, about 1,000 uh, first-dose vaccines there. Um, and that's actually been a model that we really want to replicate. So I unfortunately don't have exact dates for you on those counties. Um, but I think we have had a really great early success in Pike that we're looking to replicate elsewhere. Right. Okay, I'd like to turn to a question from Darren from Wilkes-Barre. Now it's a question about nonprofit uh, business relief. Darren, you're now live. Oh, um, yes, hello. Um, I just started a new nonprofit, and I was looking for numerous um, relief you know, programs. I've even uh, became a member to the NEPA Alliance, and it seems like there's no resources for nonprofits, even given uh, like the SBA loan programs and everything that's available. So I was just wondering, where do uh, nonprofits like myself you know, go to, or where can we go to, or is there anything in the, in the, in the works for um, for us to look forward to, to maybe be be able to apply for? Okay. Uh, first off, I want to uh, commend you for talking to the NEPA Alliance. Uh, I work with them all the time, and uh, uh, they are uh, they're very sharp. Uh, they they know a lot of the answers to these things, particularly when it, talk, it comes to economic development uh, projects that I work with them on. But I want to turn your question over to Michael Kane. Uh, Michael, what about nonprofits? It sounds like uh, mm -hmm. the, it, it sounds like you just started the the business this year, and that may, may itself be the answer that uh, that PPP and 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 uh, uh, emergency. Uh, uh, economic harm loans are not available, but what about nonprofits mm -hmm. generally? Sure. So, uh, and you're correct, Congressman, is that, um, you know, in terms of our pandemic relief programs, again, for, for organizations that uh, were in business uh, by February 15th of last year, uh, 501c3, 501c6, and 501c19 nonprofits all would qualify uh, for those particular programs. Um, and I think that the challenge presented, um, you know, uh, uh, by Darren uh, and, and Darren, you know, thank you, you know, for everything that, that you're doing. I, I think the challenge is, you know, in terms of the date, you know, so if you started your nonprofit uh, after February the 15th of last year, 
Um, that kind of takes you out of the running, if you will, um, specific for the pandemic relief programs. Um, unfortunately, SBA standard programs, we don't typically work with, with nonprofit organizations. We typically work with for-profit uh, small businesses. Um, but that said, um, I, I think that there are some programs that may be available through the U.S. Department of Agriculture and some other agencies um, that you might be able to take advantage of. Um, and, and what I'd like, if, if possible, is maybe for you to send me an email and I can speak with you uh, a little bit more offline and after I've had a chance to do a little bit more research. Uh, my email is michael.kane, K-A-N-E, at sba.gov, and we can schedule some time to talk one-on-one, -on -one, and I'll see what I can find out for you. All right. Uh, another uh, small business-related question from Joseph. Who has a small uh, a sole proprietorship uh, and received a PPP loan and has a question about forgiveness. Joseph, you're now live. Oh, hi. Good evening, uh, and thank you, um, Congressman. Uh, for doing this. Uh, I do have a question uh, for the uh, Small Business Administration. I have a sole proprietorship in Scranton, and earlier last year I applied for the PPP loan. Um, I did receive $7,800 uh, through my local bank, uh, Citizens Bank, and mm -hmm. I also received that um, uh, economic uh, uh, I don't remember the acronym, but that advance uh, as well. Um, I applied for forgiveness, and um, the last thing I, I heard back, and this was uh, in early December, that I was approved, but that they're not sure about whether or not I have to repay some of that advance money, uh, and, and I haven't heard anything since. So I don't know mm -hmm. what part is forgivable what you know what what that means by being approved uh, you know i haven't heard anything else that sounds like uh, eidl uh take it away yep. michael of course and uh, and sir i have great news for you um is that uh, as part of the economic aid act that was passed uh, back in, at the end of December, uh, the what was the uh, what was called the idle advance deduction uh, was actually repealed. So originally, um, you know what uh, the, the way that the CARES Act legislation read was that any individual that received uh, an idle advance, right? So that would be the grant that was direct from SBA uh, would be deducted uh, from any of the forgiveness. Um, that uh, that was a part of a, a PPP loan that any business got. And as I said, the, the Economic Aid Act basically repealed that deduction, and SBA, uh, beginning on February 9th and continuing through the 19th of this month, is actually working with our lenders um, that had any clients uh, that had that, uh, that um, deduction in place um, we're working with them to basically plus them up for whatever amount that was. That way your PPP loan will be fully forgivable. So what I would say, if you haven't heard anything yet about that, you might want to reach back out to your lender to see if the SBA has been in contact with them yet. And this is something that we're doing automatically um, to, uh, to make sure that all the lenders that had these deductions in place uh, basically, you know, will have them eliminated. So in essence, SBA is making a payment to the lender for that particular amount so that the, the, the forgiveness then would be taken care of. Uh, obviously, for folks that, you know, they, they could have more complicated situations where um, they didn't receive full forgiveness, maybe because they didn't spend all of the money uh, the way that you needed to to be eligible and so forth. But that particular idle advance piece uh, will be taken care of by SBA. Yeah, and um, Michael, the other thing that we changed sort of in midstream was how you how you're able to use PPP loan money. Uh, we we loosened that up quite a bit. It started off where you you had to use almost all of it to pay employees to stay on the payroll. Uh, but then what we were hearing from small businesses were was uh, it, it's well and good, but but I still have to pay the utilities and the rent or else I'm out of business. Uh, so we loosened that up quite a bit. So, uh, uh, Joseph, check with check with your banker on that. If they're giving you trouble over that, um, make sure they're looking at the latest uh, rules. Okay. Our next question is from 
Cordell in Pike County related to uh, how seniors can uh, find ways to book appointments for a COVID-19 vaccine. Cordell, you're now live. Okay. Uh, hello, Congressman. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, I'm reaching out because of my neighbor who's um, 92 years old, will be 93. He has a kidney problem. He's been trying to get a vaccination appointment since December, and he gets no response. He phones pharmacies. He gets no response. He calls the health department, no response. I think he may have called your office. I'm not sure, but I'm wondering if there's a way that someone, a senior, can call a number or go on a website with help, because some of them don't have website capabilities, and get uh, an appointment, even if it's in March or April, but some kind of connect so that they know somebody's heard them. I tried calling the uh, COVID hotline today two times and got absolutely no response. It rang once, and that was it. And uh, so... You know, it's. I know it may take, um, you know, hiring people to be on the phones, but in the end, I think we'll be ahead if we have more response to people who are trying to get the vaccination. Okay, uh, Secretary Klein, Peter. Sure, um, absolutely. So that is a frustrating experience to be sure, and I certainly would love to see what we can do to help. Um, So I think uh, generally our hope is that through the order that we issued on Friday, um, providers will now really be responsible uh, and more responsive to the needs uh, of the community by setting up these call centers um, that you can call to book an appointment. Because the appointments aren't booked through the Department of Health, um, you know, I would encourage you to continue calling your provider. Um, And our hope is that once that portion of the order to have the phone line up and running by this Friday uh, is effective, that that will help to to solve that specific challenge. Um, But I absolutely understand the frustration, um, and and we really do want to do everything we can to help. And and I'll I'll weigh in in addition. Um, The the truth is, once we get this new bill through Congress in the next couple of weeks, um, there's just going to be a lot more money for doing exactly the kinds of things you're talking about, hiring people to man the phones and and uh, uh, and, and get this vaccine out. Uh, you know, this uh, American Rescue Plan, you know, uh, uh, stay tuned on that because that's going to be the answer to a lot of this. Okay. Uh, next question is uh, from Jeanette from Mat- Matamoros, uh, actually about hazard pay. Jeanette, you're now live. Hi. I was just curious. I haven't heard anything in any of the plans discussing hazard pay for those of us who have been forced to kind of work through this whole thing. And it just seems kind of unfair that a lot of people were laid off and paid substantially more than they may regularly but those of us were in the trenches still working, you know, and are still working in it. So I was just curious if there was any talk of kind of saluting the essential workers, which we've kind of coined ourselves all sacrificial. And as I was saying, because we, we're not even on any list to get vaccines, so we're kind of all out there working, but there's no protection in place for us, nor is there any hazard pay for us. Yeah, that's, uh, this is Matt Cartwright, and I'm here to tell you I was dreading that question. Um, the truth is that was my bill, um, hazard pay for frontline workers, uh, the people out there slogging it out, going to work day in and day out, uh, putting themselves in harm's way, you know, going out of the house and, and, and having jobs where they have to get up close and personal with people as, as part of what they do. Um, and my proposal was, hey, for the for the rest of the year, this was in May, uh, for the the rest of the year of 2000, let's let's have federal hazard pay of uh, $13 extra an hour for all of these people because it because you're right. Compare them to all of the people that went on unemployment uh, and in some cases made more 
take home money than they would have made working. Uh, you know, it, it, that was a good idea. I, I know it sounds odd, but it was a good idea because we had to keep people at home. We had to keep the hospitals from becoming inundated. Still, there was this inequity with uh, people like you, the, uh, the, the frontline workers, getting nothing extra and being exposed to the danger. Uh, so that's why I introduced that bill. I was thrilled when it got made part of the HEROES Act, and that was in May. And we passed the HEROES Act out of Congress, out of the House in May. Um, and so I was, I was very hopeful that it would it would turn into law and and that kind of extra compensation for the people actually doing that putting themselves in arms way they would get extra compensation for it because after all look at what we were doing we were spreading money into the economy keep you know the economists said you have to do that you have to you have to keep the pump primed or else you're going to lose businesses that it will never come back and you're talking about a generation's worth of damage to the economy so it made sense to do it, but if you're going to do it, you should do it in an equitable way and include hazard pay for the people on the front lines of the fight. Um, I regret to say that uh, that was uh, ignored by the Senate. The Senate uh, absolutely had its face set against that, um, and uh, it didn't happen. And then in, in the HEROES Act II, uh, in August, uh, they trimmed it down. You know, that was the skinny HEROES Act. And I was uh, crestfallen to see that my bill had been actually taken out of that to make it cheaper. Uh, and even the HEROES Act too did not pass. And it wasn't until December that anything at all passed. Uh, and it, it didn't have anything like that at all. So uh, it's a long way of saying I, 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 uh, I understand what you're talking about. I was uh, the leader in the House of uh, trying to arrive at a solution, but it's just uh, politics got in the way and it didn't happen. Okay. Um, as we are coming close to our end time, I just want to take another moment for a uh, quick dial pad poll too. The Congressman every week provides uh, in updates on the COVID vaccine rollout in Pennsylvania, as well as the progression of uh, re uh, COVID relief legislation talks uh, in Congress. And so and so if you would like to be a part of the Congressman's email list to receive these weekly updates, please press one if you would like to subscribe, or two if you would not to at this time. All right. I'm going to turn to our next caller, uh, John from the Pocono area about supply of the COVID vaccine uh, for second doses. John, you're now live. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I've got my uh, I got my first vaccine shot, and it was with the hometown uh, healthcare of Northeast PA. What they did is they uh, they got the uh, high school, North Pocono High School, new high school, and uh, uh, I didn't get in the first round of vaccine. They only received like 400 doses, but the second vac uh, uh, deal there was over a thousand, and and I was I was I was amazed. Because we had our appointment, we got there right on time. We walked right in, boom, boom, boom. Did all our paperwork, with, and it was. I, uh, they have uh, Penn State nursing people there, and they all they were helped administer the shots, or whatever. But that went terrific. But now I, I see on Facebook that they are they're questioning whether they're going to get their vaccines for the second dose. And I know there's only so much vaccine out there, and I know that Penn. State, Pennsylvania, uh, uh, Governor Wolf has been trying to keep the, that there's enough vaccine for the second shot because everybody knows that you're supposed to get in within so many weeks, you're supposed to get the second shot. But now we're wondering, are, are we going to get the vaccine? Because so many other places are going to open and are trying to open up. And is there going to be enough vaccine so we all hit our deadline? Uh, I guess this is towards uh, Secretary Klein, Peter. It, it sure is, but I want to I want to amend that question to add uh, to Secretary Klein, Peter. If you know, I mean, you said you're not a cl clinician, and neither am I. But and and I, I and I wish I knew the answer. It, 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 is it a deadline, or is there a certain window, or you know, how much past uh, the the recommended second dose date are are people um, 
safe in in uh, in going to if you know sure absolutely so uh second doses in Pennsylvania and securing those second doses is of the highest importance um and the reason for that is because in order for your body to have a full uh, immune response, you need that second dose within a certain amount of time. And so we've made it very clear to providers that if they use you know, their first doses uh, as first doses, they request a commensurate number of second doses, they will get those second doses. And that is absolutely our policy and we stand by it. So if there's questions over whether or not the vaccine is coming, you know, there's actually been a lot of uh, weather incidents up and down the eastern seaboard. You know, you're even seeing today in Texas, and that has interfered with some shipping timelines that we have. And so in a number of instances, folks are getting the second doses, they're arriving a day or two late. Now, in theory, you know, the way providers should be scheduling the appointments is that if they order a dose this week, it is for administration next week with their second doses because they should be able to have that predictability since they know, you know, it's four weeks for Moderna and three weeks for Pfizer in between. They should be able to schedule that. Now, with respect to your question about the number of days in between, and Congressman, you, you put it right, 28 days is the um, minimum between Moderna doses, and it's 21 days between Pfizer doses. So that is, um, again, and I'm not a doctor, so I encourage you to talk to your doctor about this, but to the extent that uh, your body has to develop that immune response, it needs time to develop that immune response. And so the reason for the staggering between the doses is to allow your body to do what it naturally does. And so we don't want you to have it, you know, before those 21 or 28 day marks but for example, with Moderna, the CDC has said in certain instances, you know, if there is a vaccine shortage or a weather delay or what have you, that you will get similar results if you have your second dose within 42 days of your first dose. Sometimes what can happen is that actually if you delay getting that second dose, you could potentially have actually a um, a, a greater number or uh, an increased severity of uh, symptoms as a result of that second dose uh, because your body has had longer to develop that immune response. So, you know, those typical symptoms include an achy arm, um, fever, chills, um, you know, kind of like you feel like you've got a flu, some nausea, that type of thing. Um, but the CDC has come out and said particularly for um, Moderna and I believe Pfizer as well. Uh, the Pfizer timeline is different, excuse me. But for Moderna, you can have it up to the 42 days, and it's really those 21 and 28 days that that's the minimum that you can have until you get the second dose. And then, of course, there are upper bounds to it, you know, still um, being a reasonable timeline. Um, but that's sort of what I understand, and I would encourage you to talk directly with your clinician um, or, you know, a healthcare professional um, it, for additional questions that you have about the timeliness there. Okay. Uh, we have time for one, maybe two more questions. So I'd like to go to Marlene from Scranton now with a question about stimulus checks. Marlene, you're now live. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, Good evening. Uh, the reason why I, I wanted to ask it about the stimulus check, I haven't received my $600 one yet. And uh, is there anywhere I could find out how to get it? Or Right. Uh, you're not alone, Marlene. I, I'll tell you, uh, uh, back in um, March, my office started extending the the, the call-in times, uh, uh, in fact, you can still call my office from 9 until 8 p.m. every, 9 a.m. until 8 p.m. every day. But so many of the calls we got were from people who didn't get their stimulus checks. And um, 
remember it was the, the Department of the Treasury that was charged with getting out those checks. Um, and I mean, what, in my office, what would we do? We would we would call the you know the Department of the Treasury numbers, and um, the, the truth is they have been um, uh, losing employees. They've been dwindling their numbers. They've been losing people by attrition uh, for the last few years, and um, uh, that's well and good when they don't have much to do. But man, when there's a pandemic and they have to be the people getting out the stimulus checks and there's nobody there to answer the phone, that's a mess. And so we had a lot of angry folks on the on the telephone to our office wondering where those stimulus checks were. Uh, the answer is uh, it, things, things are going to be looking better, uh, and I encourage you to call my office, uh, 341-1050, and, and um, let's see if we can, uh, we can get a better answer for you now. And uh, uh, Michael, if you want to weigh in, uh, now's the time. Congressman, I, I don't really have anything else to add to, to what you just spoke about. Okay. All right, back to you, Matt. Well, all right, so we're approaching 6.30, and this is all the time we have. I do want to uh, say thank you to everyone who has joined us. We had a, a very large turnout this evening, and I hope this was helpful. Uh, before we conclude, I'd like to turn it over to the congressman uh, who can tell you how to get in touch with us going forward if we weren't able to get to your question and how to keep in touch with us. Congressman? Well, uh, and, and and that's exactly what I, what I just said. And if you didn't have a chance, didn't have your pencil out, uh, my office number is 570-341-1050. Uh, and uh, we're... Uh, we're ready to take your calls that if you we didn't get if you didn't get your question and answer. Um, you can also stay updated with the latest COVID-19 relief uh, and vaccination information by subscribing to my weekly email update. Uh, you can visit my website, cartwright.house.gov, G-O-V, to sign up. Um, and obviously, uh, a lot of the answers here involve patients. And while we wait patiently for everybody in our community to be vaccinated fully, I, I want to rem remind everybody to keep wearing a mask. These people like Fauci and Osterholm, uh, they're saying uh, in, in the absence of a vaccine, that is your best defense. Uh, to be around people wearing masks, and you're wearing one too, practicing social distancing, avoiding large gatherings. Uh, now is not the time to let up on our safety protocols. Um, and, you know, this topic came up. I, I, I want to say to the folks who are frontline workers across northeastern Pennsylvania, I'm sorry we couldn't get you monetary uh, increases. I, I meant to do that, and I tried hard. But and but uh, that doesn't mean I shouldn't say thank you as well. Thank you to the people who have kept our community running throughout this pandemic. We owe all of you our deepest, deepest gratitude. Um, and I also want to thank our panelists tonight um, and uh, Secretary Kleinpeter. Uh, you've been terrific. Uh, 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 three weeks on the job and you've you've hit the ground running and. Uh, we want to watch you as Pennsylvania catches up to our our, our states, uh, our neighbor states, um, and uh, uh, look forward to working with you. And Stephen Dixel and Michael Kane from the Small Business Administration, thank you both for for being on this call and helping me uh, answer uh, constituent uh, questions. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>